is God of everything. He is Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Alpha, the Omega, the Son of God. The soon coming king, our precious Lord, the savior of our souls. The one that was, that is, and is to come. The one that sits on the throne. The lamb of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Somebody praise God with me this morning. What a God we serve. He is mighty. He is stronger than the mountains. He is deeper than the oceans. He is a faithful, faithful, faithful God. His grace, his power, his love and his mercies, they are always there to lift us up. I don't know what you are dealing with uh, th this morning or throughout last week or this month or since the beginning of this year. I don't know how this ongoing pandemic is affecting you, but let me tell you something. Let me encourage you this morning. There is a God in heaven who specializes, who takes delight in the, in the well-being of his children. His name is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who died that we may live, who gave everything up that we may have everything. Oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. And I am not ashamed to say that I love Jesus. Praise, praise, praise the Lord. Well, once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Pathway International. My name is Tunde Disu. Thank you for joining us for on today's service. It is going to be a great day. We are going to conclude on the series that we've been doing now. This is our fourth week of looking at the topic of hope. We are going to to wrap that up today as much as possible. And you know, that does not mean we've covered everything to, to, that we need to know about hope, but at least we have a, 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 a solid foundation, a better understanding right now than we were four weeks ago. And uh, I can speak for myself and also, I, I want to believe that the same is your testimony to the goodness of God in Jesus' name, amen. And over this past four weeks, for which we've we've tried to to look at hope from different sides and different angles and different persuasions just so that we can get some understanding of hope what hope is how hope works what how to activate hope how to keep hope alive so that our faith which is the 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 key which is the prescribed way, which is the only way God prescribed for you and I as his children to live here on earth, that our faith will not fail. Our faith will, will bring forth the substance to everything that we are hoping for, that we're praying about. So we've looked at, first we looked at hope as the eyes of your heart, the ability to see without your physical eyes. Then we look at the power of hope. And then last week we were looking at how to keep your hope alive. When everything else fails, if everything else should disappear, the last thing in your life and in my life that should remain standing is our hope because for as long as you have hope, for as long as you have expectations, your faith will always come through for you. So on in today's in today's service, we are going to be looking at being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded, being fully persuaded. We're going to start by looking at the book of Job. Job chapter 14, we're going to read from verse 7 to verse 9. Job chapter 14, from verse 7 to verse 9. He said, for there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, 
that it will sprout again and the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old and in the earth and the stalk thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water it will bud and bring forth bowls like a plant. With the scent of water, not the presence of water, not the touch of water, but just the scent of water. The scent of water alone is enough for this tree that's been cut down that has stopped burden, that the root, the, the, the branch, the, 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 the stem and everything, they have decayed. They have ceased doing what trees do. The root has waxed, just the root is, is completely dismantled by the, the, the forces of nature. It's said, but by the scent of water, just the smell of water, this same tree will start to bring forth buds and plants and branches and leaves and fruits. You see, most things in life actually don't die. Most things in life don't die. There is always a residue of life hidden somewhere, all it needs, all that it requires is just a scent of expectation, a scent, a scent rather of imagination, just something to, to a glimmer of hope. And as soon as there is that light at the end of the tunnel, as soon as that, there is that flicker of light, life comes back into that which is supposedly dead. All that anything in life need to resurrect and, 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 and come back to fullness of life is hope, is expectation, is imagination, is the willingness to not let go of your conviction. The, the refusal to accept that that's it, that's your lot, that's your portion, that is it, now it's over. No, it is never over. Maybe there's, you're struggling in your marriage. You've been to every counselor, every counselor. You've done everything that is prescribed and nothing seems to, it, it's just not working. Don't give up, have hope. Just have that expectation. Remember what brought you together in the first place. Revisit that old experience that you've shared together and use that as your beacon of hope, of expectation. Imagine what it used to be. Is it your business? Especially in this, in this season that the whole world is living in. Is it that business that you put all your life savings and invested all your energy into and so, and now because of the pandemic, people are closing their shops and, and, and going home? Just expect, just have that hope because they sent of water will bring back life into that which is supposedly dead. Have you not heard of, uh, uh, so for some time now, they talk about, uh, they discover some fossils of dead animals and, and bugs and insects in the rock after thousands of years, and they bring them into an environment that is, that is conducive and suddenly, Life comes back after so many years, thousands of years of them being locked into a rock somewhere. 
that environment, that supposedly conducive environment that, that injected life back into that is hope, is expectation, is the imagination of the, or of the archaeologists or the scientists or whoever, the biologists that said, there must be something that we can do with this thing. Let me tell you, your current situation is not the sum total of your life. Your current dealings, the way, wherever you are right now, it's not the end of the story concerning you. You can come back stronger. You can come back better. You can come back bigger than ever before. If you can just imagine it, if you can just expect it, if you can just pursue it, if you can just refuse to let go of your expectations. You know, this world is filled of many millionaires and wealthy people and rich people. But when you read their stories, when you dig deeper into their journey, you will discover that they didn't just wake up as millionaires. Even those who inherited it, didn't inherit it. They didn't become millionaires just like that. Many of them had gone through disappointments and setbacks and failures and even bankruptcy many times. But there is something on the inside of them that refuse to die, will just continue to come back alive. And that thing is their hope is their expectation, is their willingness to not let go of their, of their hope. Psalm 146 verse 5 said, Happy is he that had the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Happy is that person. Happy is that person. Happy are you when you refuse to let go of your hope. Your hope, my hope, our hope is connected. It's, a, it's connected to our joy and our happiness. Regardless of what is going on, regardless of the situation, you must keep your expectation. You must keep your hope in God who cannot fail, who will not fail, who will not disappoint you. You see, life circumstances, the challenges of life, they have the tendency, in fact, their main purpose is to drain you of any, any shred of hope that you have. Any shred of hope left in you, the, the life issues are there to just pull them out of you so that you can lose your joy and lose your happiness. But when you refuse, when you say no, that's not that is not on my watch. Guess what? They will tug their tails between their feet and run like you've never seen. Joy is an internal state of being. It's a product of your conviction, of the assurance that you have of the truth, not the facts, the truth. But happiness, on the other hand, is a function of what is happening on the outside of you. But without hope, when your hope is not strong enough, those external circumstances, they have the power to shut down and deem and quench every, every tiny little bit of hope that is left in you. But if you refuse to let go, if you refuse to not do what the world would normally, the way the, the children of this world would, would deal with hopelessness, they will go into drinking. They will try to substitute it with taking drugs. Some will do some shopping. Some will eat themselves to, to whatever. But that is not who you are. You have a God who is faithful to his word. No wonder Proverbs chapter 10 verse 28 tells us, it says, the hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. The hope 
of the righteous. You and I are the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, our hope, our expectation, our imagination, our understanding, what we are, the result we are, we are looking up for is that of gladness, is of joy, is of happiness. If you are operating in hope, if you live, if, you're, if you let your hope, if you refuse for your hope to die, you should not be like the children of this world who live in dread, who live in fear, who live in, 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 a, in, a, in a no man's land where they dread of things like getting old. They dread of things like falling ill. They dread of things like running out of, of resources. They dread of things like growing old all by themselves. But when you live in dread, when you do allow the fear and the worries of this world to consume you so much so now you're living your life in dread, what you are doing is you are cursing your future rather than blessing it. Job said, the things that are feared has come upon me. Because he invested his expectations in dread, in fear, in anxiety, in worry, rather than put his expectation in the God who cannot fail. Your hope will anchor your soul on the good expectations that God promised. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you of peace and to do you good, not of evil. If that is God's promise, or since that is God's promise, because it's not an if, since that is what God has promised, let's just lock ourselves into that expectation rather than living in fear and dreading the evil that is in this world. Am I saying you, your life will have no challenges? No, that's not what I'm saying. Am I saying everything will just be like a walk in the park and you'll be singing Kumbaya? No, that's not what I'm saying. But you see, it is not the challenges that come that is the issue. The question is, how would you address them? How would you counter them? What is what has become the 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 anchor that is holding your your soul in place? Remember the story of Father Abraham. According to Romans chapter four verse eighteen, he said, "Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father." of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. We all know the story of Abraham and Sarah. We all remember from Sunday school to Monday school, the stories that we've heard of the journey, the life story of Father Abraham and his wife, Sarah, before they receive the promise of God. And this passage in Romans is telling us that even against hope, when all is done, when even hope has stopped hoping, he still believed in hope. Why? Because he trusted the God who made the promise, who said, so shall thy seed be. Do you think he wakes up every morning singing and dancing? No. You think he wakes up every morning and, and no. Every morning he wakes up and he looks at his physical body. Every morning he wakes up and he, he considers the situation with his wife. Every morning he looked around and there is not a single child from his loins. So much so he went to God and said, what will you give me? Is it this Eliezer, my servant, that will be my head? What is all this about? But then God said to him in Genesis chapter 26, verse 4, 
and I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. What has God promised you? What is that promise that he, had, he gave you? What, what Can you remember that whisper in your ear? That silent, gentle voice in your heart that you didn't hear. You didn't hear it with your physical ears. But somewhere on the inside of you, in your being, in your heart, in your spirit, you heard loud and clear what he said. Would you, why would you then allow the existence of physical reports bring you to a point where you, you doubt what was said to you? Faithfully see. That doctor's report in your hand. That your bank balance that you have, you have seen now on your phone or tablet or on, on, on your computer, that, that this pandemic that the whole world is going through, the rate of unemployment, oh yes, the stock market is dying and the, the cryptocurrency is crashing, Bitcoin has become almost whatever. All those are facts. They are facts. But you know the good thing, the good news about all of this is they are facts. And because they are facts, they are subject to change. Hallelujah. They are facts. It's a fact that the cancer has come back. It's a fact that your bank balance is showing zero under minus zero and some red figures in front of it. It is through that you have been affected. Your business has been affected. Your family has been affected. Your sound mind has been affected by, the, by this pandemic. They are facts. And because they are facts, they are subject to change. But then there's the word of God. Hallelujah. The word of God is the truth. And the truth will always be the truth. There is no half truth. Every half truth is a whole lie. The, the truth, which is the word of God, will remain forever. The truth will every day of the week and seven times on a Sunday, the truth will outlast and supersede the facts. So why, why would you let the facts slap you down, kick you down, and keep you down when you have the truth, which is the word of God, which is the promises of God, which is the covenant of God, which is God himself. See, your vision, the image that you form in your vision, the, 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 the picture that you paint in your mind that you see with the eye with your eyes must never be formed or based on facts because facts are subject to change. There are statistics, there are elements that will affect them that are beyond your human control. But when you live your life based on the truth, which is the word of God, you will be like Abraham. All Abraham had, everything that was going through him, the only thing Abraham had were five words. So shall thy seed be. So shall thy seed be. That was all Abraham had, and that was enough for him. What word do you have from God? What has he said to you? 
What did God say to you? What have you anchored your soul, your being on today? What is that thing that heaven and earth may pass away, but you know this is my word? I ain't, it's not going anywhere. Because Abraham kept his focus on God. He kept his focus on God. He anchored his hope on those five words, so shall thy seed be. He refused to contemplate or consider anything else. And he didn't do like many of us would do. He didn't lean on his own understanding. Have you not heard of people? They will say, oh, God told me this. God said this to me. Oh, this is what God said I should do. And then they will go to the so-called experts. They will go to another man to validate, to confirm what God said to them. Now, there is a place for counsel. There is, there, in fact, the Bible said, in a multitude of counsel, there is safety. There is a place for counsel. But when the purpose of your consulting with these people is to validate the word of God to you, you've, you've, you've taken the wrong turning. You've just taken the wrong exit at that roundabout. Because what these people will give you are their opinions and their understanding and their exposure, which all are based on facts. And every fact is subject to change. What's your hope based on this one? What have you anchored your hope on this morning? Is he on facts or the truth? Because the, that, that passage in Romans chapter 4 that we read, if you continue reading from verse 18 to verse 20, he said, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so that shall thy seed be. Look at the next verse. And be not weak in faith, be not, not weak in faith. Abraham's faith was not weak. How can somebody's faith not be weak? How do you measure the strength of somebody's faith? How do you quantify the stamina of somebody's faith? Check what they're expecting. Check what they're focusing on. Because the Bible tells us that Abraham considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He staggered not. Yes, the facts are just right in front of his eyes. Yes, the facts are living in his body. Yes, he can read the, the statistics in Sarah's life. I know many people have said, oh, Sarah was uh, uh, 90 something years old. So she's past the uh, childbearing state. And that is true. But the reality is, Sarah was, Sarah was barren all along. So it wasn't about just her age. It was the fact that Abraham knew that his wife was barren even from before she was 70. The strength of his faith was his hope and his expectation. And that is, the, the, that is what makes his faith not to be weak. He staggered not at the Promise of God through unbelief. And we're going to do a series at some point. The difference between doubt, between faith, doubt, and unbelief. Because 
it, 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 some of the things people call doubt are unbelief. Some of the things people call unbelief, they are doubt. And in between of them, if you live anywhere around them, your faith is, is, is zero. He staggered not. He, did, he refused to exercise unbelief. But he was strong in faith. You know, unbelief is a choice. Unbelief is a choice. It's when you've considered all the facts and you still choose to go the other way. You have seen the truth. But for out of your own free volition, you still decide, no, I don't, I'm not receiving that. Unbelief is the choice that you make by allowing the image, the picture that is formed on the inside of you to be based on the facts, to be based on contrary sources than the word of God. When you make those things, the, the, the foundation, the premise, the, 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 salt, the rock upon which your faith is, is built, you know the result. Because Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 tells us, that God on, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. What power is working in you? Is the power of doubt? Is the power of unbelief? Is the power of faith? Is it the power of hope? Is it the power of nothing at all? Because the ability to see the exceeding abundantly and above everything you can think or ask or demand or desire is if all of that, they are functions of the power that is working. And if that power is not hope, if that power is not based on the word of God, if that power is not driven and, and consumed by the truth, which is the word of God, don't be surprised if you have nothing to show at the end of the day. Because Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4 verse 21 tells us, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also, he was able also to perform. Romans chapter 4, verse 21. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God has promised, God is also able to perform it, to deliver it. How persuaded are you this morning? How persuaded are you right now concerning the word of God? Concerning the promises of God? Concerning your walk with God? Concerning your life, your children, your marriage, your business, your finance, your health? How persuaded are you of the promises of God concerning all of your life? Are you fully persuaded? Or are you just persuaded? Or are you not persuaded? Or you don't even know what persuasion is? You know, full persuasion. Being fully persuaded comes from two sources. For you to be fully persuaded, there are two sources to your full persuasion. Number one is the integrity of the person who gave you the promise. The integrity of God who said, I will do what I promised. The second source of full persuasion 
is the clarity of the image that has been formed on the inside of you, which is a product of what you have been focusing on, of what you have been meditating on, of what you are imagining, of what you are desiring. It is those that the clarity of that picture, of that image, of that structure will bring you to a point where you just know. Sometimes you know so much you can't even explain it. You just know. You've gone beyond the point of believing. You Now you know. When you have those two things together, the integrity of God who promised, the clarity of the image that has been formed on the inside of you, when you have those two working for you, full persuasion is in operation. And your expectations will never, ever, ever be disappointed. But you see, many people don't come to the point of full persuasion because they don't know God. They know about him. They know about God, but they don't know him. And because they don't know him, they cannot put their full weight of trust, of reliance on the integrity of God and of his word. But when full persuasion becomes the anchor that holds you in place steadfastly, especially in the face of contrary reports and, and physical evidences, you are unstoppable. See, just because you can see the physical report, just because you can handle the physical report in your hand, does not make it the final say. It does not make it the sum total of your life. Whose report will you believe? Now, I'm not against medical doctors or, or bankers or this or that. They got, thank God for them. But you see, they didn't create you. They went there when you were formed and pulled together. They don't know what God's purpose for your life is. Yes, they can report on what they see. Thank God for that. But that is their report. There is a higher, better, stronger, more solid report. And it is the word of God. It's the truth. It's the promise. It's the covenant of God. Full persuasion. Being fully persuaded. Is based on the integrity of God and of his word. He said, heaven, all of heaven, the whole of earth can all just melt away, but not his word. He has actually, the Bible said he's lifted the, the weight and the integrity of his word above his name. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, from verse 2 to verse 5. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Tribulations, experience, patience, 
trials, oppositions, call it what you want. The ultimate, the final point for all of them is to bring you to a place where you have to consider the expectations that you have of God against the reality of this persecution, of this, of these tribulations, of these trials, of these temptations that you are dealing with. He said, no temptation befalls a man except that which is common, but God is faithful. That's all. Oh, yes, that is all. He is a faithful God. Hope maketh not ashamed. That's, that's enough to be joyful. That's enough to be happy. That's enough to just scream and shout and, and just want to punch the air to say, yes. But if you are not rejoicing, if you are not happy, if you are sad and 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 you you just just grumpy, it's not because of the circumstances that you are facing. It's not because of the situation that you are going through. It is simply because you have allowed those situations to dim or dampen the light of your hope, the, the shining of your of your expectations, because you have allowed them to give you a contrary report to believe. That's why you're not happy. Because whether we like it or not, we will all face one form of tribulation or another, one form of trial or another, one form of hardship or another. But the Bible tells us in the passage we just read that the tribulation, they work patience. And patience gives us experience. And experience gives us hope. And when hope is infused into the equation, guess what? Faith. Faith. Faith is sent on an error. Come on, quick, quick. Chop, chop. Go and get this thing done. What is your hope this morning? How persuaded are you of this expectation? Because First Peter chapter 18, sorry, First Peter chapter 18, where is that from? <laughs> first, <laughs> first Peter chapter 1 from verse 8 to verse 9. He said, whom having not seen, you love, in whom thou now see him not, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. We haven't seen Jesus physically. We have not seen him physically. Yes, some people said they saw him in their dreams and saw him in their visions and, and all of that. But physically, like, we, ha we haven't seen him. But even though, despite the fact that we have not seen him, yet we believe to the point of rejoicing with joy unspeakable, full of glory, and because we believe him, even though we have not seen him, based on the truth of his word, based on the promises of God, based on the fact that God will not lie, cannot lie, we have received the end of our expectation, which is the salvation of our souls. Nobody, no man, woman, boy, or girl can become born again, can accept Christ as Lord and Savior without being fully persuaded. There has to come that point in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, where you just, you just can't argue with it anymore. When you become fully persuaded, now salvation is at your heart. So we haven't seen Jesus with our physical eyes. 
But yet, in our hearts, we have seen him. We've seen him so clearly in our hearts. We've become fully persuaded of his existence, of his promises, of, his, of, his, of everything that he has done and is doing and is going to do to us, to the point where we, we lift up holy hands and said, come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. And boom, salvation is, is in your life. How persuaded are you this morning concerning anything and everything else in your life apart from the salvation of your soul? How persuaded are you? How fully persuaded are you right now of that challenge that you are facing at your workplace, of that thing that you are contending with in your body? How fully persuaded are you of the promises of God? We are so fully persuaded about of Jesus concerning his promises. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are for men most miserable, which means our, our conviction, our full persuasion, our, our ah, let me slow down. Our full persuasion of him. It's just not about what we do here on earth. We, we, it has, it just, just stretch all the way to eternity. That's why we know that there is a mansion with your name and my name on it in heaven. That's why we know that we're going to, we're going to sit at the dinner table and just spread your big self, small self, no self, every self, and you just eat to your fullness. You're going to hear the angels sing. You're going to walk on that street of gold. You're going to sit in his presence and just behold his glory. Oh, being fully persuaded. Oh, yes, we have all the promises here on earth. You will prosper. You will be in health. You will be promoted. You will have a wonderful family. They, great as those are, there is something else out there. There is something else in your future and in my future. And it, we, we're so, so persuaded of it so much so that we just, we are longing. Jesus was so fully persuaded of this day that we will be here in Pathway, here at Pathway International, talking about him. He was so fully persuaded that he just said to the Roman soldier, come on, nail it. Give it a big, big bang. Because in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, he tells us, he said, looking unto Jesus, take your example from Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You think the nail was not painful? It was. You think those, those Roman whips didn't hurt him? I'm telling you, he, he, he ripped his back. You think when they pierce his side with that, with that spirit, you think, I mean, he, he bled. He was so disfigured, he couldn't be recognized. But in all of that, there is something else. There is, a, there is this hope. There is this expectation. There is this focus that he had, he had concerning you and me. So much so that he was, he was rejoicing to say, come on, let's do this. Psalm 147, verse 11, he said, The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in him. Hebrews 11, verse 6, he said, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Before, in order for you to come to God, if you have to go through the gate of being fully persuaded, of being fully, just full persuasion, not of what he's going to do or what he has done, but just you start with being fully persuaded that he 
is. Is what he is who he said he is. You have to be fully persuaded of his person, of his of his deity, of his of of his presence, before you start talking of what he's going to do, what he has done, and what is. It is by faith that we please God. But your faith and my faith will be impotent without hope. So if you want to, if the desire is to please God, then we must engage to the point of full, full persuasion, the fuel of hope into our faith so that our faith can come alive and then God will be pleased. Have you heard? People, when they talk of hope, they were very quick to quote Proverbs 13, verse 12, that hope deferred, make the heart sick. And they don't go beyond that. But if you read further, he said, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. But you see, the reason people think their hope is deferred, the reason people think their faith is not working, the reason people are not fully persuaded is because they become weary. They confuse hope with wish. Their hope is not specific. The picture that their hope is painting is not clear enough. It's not, it's not strong enough for faith to latch onto it. If it's not fully developed, your faith is still waiting. Come on, finish this thing. Come on, let's complete this thing. The reason people are not fully persuaded is because they also lack patience. How persuaded are you this morning as we close? How persuaded are you right now concerning God, concerning Jesus, concerning the truth, concerning the word, concerning the promises, concerning your life, your journey, your existence, your experience, concerning your being. How persuaded are you? Is your persuasion based on facts and statistics or is it based on the truth, which is the word of God? Because what determines your time and my time of manifestation is not faith. <laughs> oh, oh, Father, help us. What determines the full manifestation of your, of your expectation? What determines when you take delivery of what your, what your faith is working on? It, it is not your faith. What determines when you receive is how long it takes for your hope to fully develop that image, for your hope to fully com to complete the structure, how long it takes for your hope to finish the, the, the picture, the image that is being formed of that thing you're expecting. Because until that picture is fully completed, your faith is still waiting. But once that picture is fully developed, you don't need to pray for faith. It's a nat natural progression that when your hope is fully developed, when your imagination is fully captured, when your expectation is fully formed in you, when you have gone beyond the point of believing, you've come to the point of knowing, when you are fully persuaded that the God who made the promise is he's able to do it, he will fulfill it, he will deliver it, when there is no doubt or unbelief in your heart, you don't need to pray for faith. So, Instead of striving and working and struggling to, oh, Father, increase my faith. Oh, Lord, enlarge my faith. Oh, Lord, multiply my faith. Instead of wasting your time and energy praying these unbelieving prayers, 
Just concentrate on strengthening your imagination. Concentrate on empowering your hope. Concentrate on completing the image, the picture by the eyes of your heart to see that which is not visible. Because when that image is fully formed, when that picture is fully developed, when that when you have come to the point of being fully persuaded, faith will just breathe into it. And that clay will become a living soul. Become fully persuaded so that your faith can be injected with the power of hope and faith will have no choice but to deliver maximally, exponentially, without holding back, far and above, pressed down, shaking together, running over into your bosom. Because without hope, faith is impotent. Without hope, faith is useless. Without hope, faith is powerless. Without hope, faith has nothing to do. And the only prescribed way for you and I to live a full, successful life is by faith. So, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude by telling you, by saying, work on your hope. Strengthen your hope. Energize your hope and your faith will deliver beyond your wildest dream. And this concludes our study on hope. Thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. The entrance of your word brings light. Thank you for the light of your word that has just eliminated every area of darkness concerning our hope and concerning our faith, concerning your word and your truth. Thank you, Lord, that the preaching of your word will be followed with signs and wonders. Therefore, we expect testimonies we expect manifestations. We expect the fullness of our hope, even from this day. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. It's in Jesus' mighty name we have received. And everybody shout, amen.